I'm Don Rosenberg, and this is Living the Classical Life. Donald Rosenberg, thank you so much for being here on Living the Classical Life. We're delighted to welcome you onto the show. Thank you for having me. So I've been reading your reviews basically since the time I came here to Cleveland, which was 17 years ago, and that formed the basis of a lot of my musical education. I even recall uh, an occasion where you visited my freshman class colloquium and addressed us about the critic's role with regards to the audience. Don, how did you go from being a music student to deciding that you wanted to go more in the direction of music criticism? I really didn't decide, and I never intended to be a music critic. I was at Yale in the music school uh, doing graduate studies as a French horn player, and I decided to take an elective course in music criticism, which was taught by Paul Hume, who was then the music critic of the Washington Post. He was the music critic who reviewed a soprano named Margaret Truman in 1950 and wrote a review in which he said that Miss um, Truman sang flat. And the next day he was at the newspaper going through his mail and he saw this envelope from the White House. And it was a letter from the President of the United States essentially castigating him for writing so negatively about his daughter, who thought she was a soprano. Um, so Mr. Hume called his colleague up at the other newspaper and said, Irving, you have to see this. So they got together. He showed him this letter from the President of the United States. And on the next day, on the other newspaper's front page, was a story about the President of the United States threatening the life of a music critic. And so Paul Hume became world famous for 15 minutes. Well, he came to Yale uh, once a week during a semester and gave a course in music criticism. And so I decided I'd like to see what this is about. So uh, he had us write different kinds of things in class. And uh, he liked some of the things I wrote and was very encouraging. Then the course ended, and I went back to being a horn player. So I graduated uh, Yale in 1977 with two master's degrees in French horn and no job. So I went back to my hometown in New Jersey, and while I was looking for a job, I took a position in a, an establishment that I had worked in several previous summers, it was the local bagel store. One day at the bagel store, the phone rang, and it was uh, Yale calling, saying there's an opening for a music critic in Akron, Ohio. Would you be interested? And I said, anything's better than making bagels. So he said, OK, an editor at the Beacon Journal will call you in five minutes. Five minutes later, at the bagel store, the phone rang. And it was an editor from the Beacon Journal saying, our music critic is leaving. Uh, would you be interested in coming to try out for this position? I said, sure, what do I have to do? He said, send us some clips. And there was total silence because I had no idea what a clip was. He said, send us some examples of your writing. So I said, well, all I have are some program notes and my master's project on the Wagner tuba. The guy probably had no idea what I was talking about. But he said, send them along. So I sent them along. A couple weeks later, they said, come out and go to some concerts and write something, and we'll see if this will work. So I went out. I reviewed a recital. I reviewed a Cleveland Orchestra concert with Lauren Mazel conducting Prokofiev V. And I reviewed a Cleveland Ballet performance, because ballet dance was part of the job. And I went home, back to the bagel store, and a couple days later they called and invited me to come and be their music critic. So I decided, all right, I'll give this a year or two and see how it goes. 
And it's 40 years later. I'm stuck in the, stuck in the door. So the pianist Christian Zimmerman said that successful criticism in music is almost like a broadcast ant antenna for a radio station and the receiver. Each has to be aligned to the same high frequency, meaning the performer and the critic, or perhaps even the music. How do you know, as the critic, that you are sensitive enough to review the music and the performer in question? Well, I think a serious music critic takes the art of criticism as seriously as the performer does. In other words, it takes a lot of preparation, takes a lot of homework, takes a lot of score reading, and then it takes a lot of concentration once you're sitting in the performance. You have to focus entirely on what's going on on stage. Nothing else matters at that point. In fact, the world doesn't exist except for what's happening between the performer and the audience. And so I think what Mr. Zimmerman says is very true. The music crit critic has to be so in sync with what's happening musically that he or she can be able to describe what that experience is like. And it only happens when you totally turn everything else off. Okay, so if we talk about music as being able to describe what words can't, how do you summon the words to describe the musical arts? Well, as you say, it's a different language. And so, in a way, it's impossible. You can't really recreate what music can express. But what you can do is to try to use language that gives you the atmosphere or the expressive aura of what the music is telling you or what the artist is telling you. And so it's a constant challenge for the critic to come up with vocabulary that is not only uh, colorful and insightful, but also accessible. Because most of the people who read reviews uh, are not musicians and they don't know the technical language of music. And so you have to avoid any kind of jargon. What you have to do is to uh, filter, as I said, the essence of the experience and try to convey what the, um, the feeling was of that performance, of that music, and how it uh, came across. And of course, whether you think it succeeded or failed. Does it Successful critic have to be a musician. I know that you happen to be one, and I know that one of the most famous ones in history, Robert Schumann, was a fantastic one. Is it necessary? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You said he was a fantastic musician. <laughs> I was just a musician. Yeah. You want to ask that question again? <laughs> <laughs> this interview is over. It's okay. like, I've, ha I've had All right. it. <laughs> okay. It certainly doesn't hurt. I couldn't be a music critic without having been a musician first. I just feel that the knowledge you need to have and the experience you need to have had as a musician can only help in the whole process of assessing performances and artists. There's no way I could ever have done this without being fully trained as a musician. I mean, just the score reading aspect of, of it is so crucial, I think. Uh, knowing what's really happening in the music and having had the experience of reproducing some of that music is invaluable for the critic. What happens when you're assigned to review a concert in which the piece is entirely new? What criteria do you use to form your impressions? If we assume that we as audience members and musicians have our own progression with the music that makes sense to us, how do we know that we're not going to get it wrong? Well, with any new music, you don't know if you're getting it right anyway, because sometimes the language is so new that you're completely unfamiliar with it. And so you have to try to use your best instincts as a musician and as a critic and listen as closely as possible 
and try to describe what you've heard. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to make a judgment about new music the first time you hear it, unless you've been able to read a score beforehand or attend a rehearsal, which is always a good thing for a critic to do, in order to be uh, prepared by the time you write your review. So uh, listening to mu new music is always a, a, a big challenge, but it's also an exciting challenge because you're dealing with something that has never been heard before, has language that perhaps is not familiar, and uh, using those muscles to describe what you've heard is, is a bit of a stretch, which is very good. What happens when a critic feels that he or she has gotten it wrong? That perhaps you've heard something that you weren't ready to receive? perhaps musically, emotionally, intellectually, and then later you realize that uh, you had been wrong in your assessment of either the music or the performer. Well, I think a critic has to be pretty confident about what he or she is going to write. Uh, and this idea of right and wrong essentially doesn't exist because what's right for you may be wrong for me. And so it has to be a very personal statement based on, first of all, facts and based on training and knowledge. And so when I'm reviewing something that is unfamiliar or an artist who's new, I think the important thing is to be able to um, elucidate that artist's gifts or the qualities of the music as best you can. Now, whether it's right and wrong, people are going to agree and disagree, believe me. Um, they're going to take exception to what you write, no matter what you write. But you can't write anything if you're concerned about that. You have to be very sure of what you're going to say at the moment that you write it. You may not be sure when you're listening to it, but by the time you put it down on, not paper anymore, the time you type it onto your laptop, you have to be assured enough so that the reader is sure that, number one, you know what you're talking about, and that they're getting a report that's accurate. So Don, I'm trying to get a sense of what it feels like for you to write a review. As it's happening, as you're, at, at what point after the concert do you feel like the, the article that you're producing has been formed in your mind? Is it immediately? Is it during the performance? Is it much later? That will depend upon what time of my career you're talking about. Because it changed a lot during my now 40 years in this business. Uh, when I started, we were typing onto paper, which was um, scanned and then put back into the, um, the room where they put the hard type on the, on the page. So there was time. There was, I worked at an afternoon newspaper, the Akron Beacon Journal first. So there was time to think about it. There was time to uh, change things. When I started working in Cleveland, they wanted overnight reviews, which meant that I had to write at Severance Hall immediately after the concert. And the deadlines kept getting shorter and shorter. And so there were times when I had to write a review in 30 minutes. And so what you're doing during the concert is you're listening very closely. You are trying to formulate some kind of structure or what your, your review is going to be about. And you never know until the very end, because you don't know what's important about a concert until you've heard the whole concert. And you don't know if the, if the conductor is going to fall off the podium until the last movement. That's news. You, that's going to be the lead of your review. But if there's something during this concert that is so distinctive, that's what you want the subject of your review to be. And so you don't know until you sit, I didn't know, until I sat in front of the laptop 
and I had to start writing. And then I had to structure it basically as a stream of consciousness kind of review because I had 30 minutes to write uh, a cogent, insightful review in good English. And it was a challenge, but it was the adrenaline kept you going. And the performance was so fresh that you could express yourself very directly, perhaps too directly at times, mm -hmm. but it was alive. And that continued for many years until the deadlines changed again and it was no longer possible for it to be the next day. Then it was the day after. Then I could go home and go to sleep and wake up in the morning and write the review, which was not really ideal either because I would go home and I would think about it all night. So the danger there is that the writing is not as fresh and your impressions are not as fresh. Okay, so if you're writing a review within 30 minutes, do you even have time to think about what kind of tone you're going to adopt? Are you trying to foster a sense of musical community with your readership? Are you trying to educate them? Are you trying to inform a performer about your impressions of feedback as to how they should change things? Does that enter into your mind at all or is that just extremely overthinking it? Yes. Mm -hmm. You're trying to convey your impressions of the experience and nothing else comes into play. Uh, the artist's response to your review doesn't matter. Um, the orchestra's response to your review doesn't matter. What matters is that you are able to build a review that gives an accurate and, you hope, perceptive response to that, that concert. And so, all of these other considerations essentially are, are meaningless. What's important is that you want to convey to the reader what happened and whether what happened was successful or whether it was a failure. And both of those things happen. So what happens when you get feedback that isn't positive? Someone's in the audience who's angry at what you wrote or the performer is offended. What do you do, what do, you do then? All I can say is it's, it's one person's opinion. I mean, there's nothing you can do. Once you've written your review and once it's published, there it is. And today it's even more um, challenging because, you know, once you press the button, it's on Google within 15 minutes and it's there forever. So uh, you have to try not to bring these psychological barriers into your job as a critic. What you have to do is you have to sit there and try to reflect what you believe is the truth about that experience. I mean, that's what any journalist should do anyway. With a critic, it's a little different because you're not just reciting facts. You're blending the facts with the opinion. So for most of music criticism, the profession, if we can call it that, relied on the existence of newspapers. I think that newspapers in printed form seem to be on their way out. A lot of newspapers in their online formats don't cover the arts anymore. Does the profession of music criticism still exist in the form that you knew it? It certainly doesn't exist in the form that I knew it. Uh, there used to be, 15 years ago, I would say there were 75 full-time music critics at American newspapers. There are now about 15. But a lot of the job of being a music critic has shifted to the web. And there are a lot of online sites that cover classical music and there are a lot of people writing about classical music and there are some very good ones and there are some very bad ones as might be expected on this kind of a forum. Um, but I don't know if it'll ever, it probably will never return to what it used to be. It's just not, it's just not the reality of, of life today in the internet world.
It seems to me that online anyone can be a critic these days. You read right. whatever feedback is left on a recording on Amazon. What sets apart your role as a serious critic from just the opportunity that anyone can be a critic? Well, again, I think it goes back to your training, your experience, uh, your uh, ability to treat it with great seriousness. And when I say serious, that doesn't mean without humor, but it means that you need to have a real connection with the subject and with the artists in terms of knowing or perceiving what they're doing and not just using it as a form for a hobby or being a fan. That is, uh, that's, I think, detrimental to the field. Your journey here in Cleveland with the Cleveland Orchestra eventually led to you publishing your magnum opus, a 700-page book about the Cleveland Orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra story. How did this project come about and how were you changed as a person as a result of this project? This happened because uh, David Gray, the publisher of Gray and Company, uh, contacted me and said he wanted to do some kind of book about the Cleveland Orchestra. And we talked about it for more than a year, what kind of book we would do. And I said, well, I think the only way I can do this book is if I receive the approval of the Cleveland Orchestra to use their archives and to really go into depth about the orchestra. I was very curious about this orchestra for several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons was I'm not from Cleveland. I'm from the East Coast. Uh, I'm from east of the Delaware River. And if you know people on the East Coast, they tend to be rather territorial. And I wanted to find out how Cleveland, a small industrial city, nurtured this titanic ensemble. I mean, what were the forces that it took to create this orchestra and to develop it and sustain it? And so that was my mission. And by going through hundreds of boxes and thousands and thousands of pages and documents, I tried to put together a story that described who the people were and how it developed over many decades into the um, singular ensemble that it is. And it, it took a lot of work on many fronts, uh, not just the conductors, but from the initial creators of the orchestra, Adela Prentice Hughes and Nikolai Sokolov, the first music director, and the board, John Severance, uh, Dudley Blossom, a lot of other philanthropists and industrialists who supplied the money to, to uh, nurture this orchestra. And then the people they hired, the musicians they hired, um, how they made connections with the community and how this city came to believe that this was something that was important for for the cultural life of this city. And I think that's what has maintained the quality of the Cleveland Orchestra because this community got really used to music making on a stratospheric level. Um, it's, it's no higher anywhere else in the world. That doesn't mean that great things don't happen in a lot of cities with a lot of major orchestras, they do. But Cleveland has been this little gem in the global firmament of symphonic ensembles. So what's the quality that most excites you about the Cleveland Orchestra? What makes this orchestra so special? I think the Cleveland Orchestra has an ability to um, convey what's in a score with incredible precision and truth. It's not an orchestra that goes out of its way to 
be spectacular or to overstate. It's quite the opposite. And this goes back all the way to Rajinsky and Zell. Zell wanted the orchestra to play like a, a chamber ensemble where all the musicians were listening to each other or could hear where things were coming from and where they were going and how to balance things very carefully. Um, he was a, a taskmaster in that respect, but he instilled this kind of discipline in this ensemble that's still there today. And I, it's just been passed down by musicians through the generations. It's still the orchestra that Zell built. And I really go back to Wojcicki. I think he was the first one to start to instill this, this discipline and this um, fidelity to the written page. Now that may sound like it's antiseptic, but it's, it's not in, in the hands of a, uh, an imaginative and sensitive conductor. It means that the blueprint is there and there's so much to work with. And this orchestra will do whatever a conductor wants. So if we talk about a critic as being in a position that needs objectivity, is that really possible? I mean, can you think, for example, of a performance that moved you to tears here in Cleveland? Tears in a positive way or in a negative way? Take your pick. <laughs> well, there have been lots of performances that have thrilled me. That's certainly the case. Um, there have been performances that did the opposite, that turned me off or even angered me. But that's the way it is in, in the life of music. I mean, you, you go into a concert hoping for a special experience. And sometimes you get it, and sometimes you don't. And this idea of objectivity is, I would say, not very apropos because Yes, you have to be accurate. You have to be factual with the facts. But there has to be a lot of your own viewpoint in conveying what the performance achieved. Or it's not worth reading. Do you miss your job reviewing the Cleveland Orchestra? I don't. I reviewed the Cleveland Orchestra for 28 years. I probably went to several thousand concerts and I heard a lot of pieces many times. And so I had, I had a good long run. I mean, those kinds of runs don't exist anymore in this business. So I was, I was very lucky. With the changing world of music today, how do you see your role in the world as a critic? I think it's important for critics to be disseminating the wonder of this repertoire. It needs to be it needs to be nurtured, it needs to be loved. It needs to be written about in a very forthright and sensitive way so that you hope more people will become interested in it. Um, and so, if it's not being written about, it, it, I think it's going to harm the field. So the more writing there is, the better it is for the field. Uh, people need to have this information. And you hope that you spark the kind of interest that will prompt them to Try it. Go to concerts. Learn how magnificent these works are and how rich it is. So, having written your book about the Cleveland Orchestra, do you think that there's another, another book in you on another subject? Well, there is another book. I have, I have to drum up the, the courage to try to get it published. It's a novel based in the orchestra world. That's all I'll tell you.
<laughs> Donald Rosenberg, thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure to have you on thank and you. to hear some insights into your work and your world. And I wish you much luck in moving forward. Thanks very much. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>